must confess as we sing these next songs, this is a song that here lately has really kind of sat down on top of my soul. I'm still thankful no matter what title, no matter how long I've been saved, no matter where I've been, no matter what I've come through, I'm glad that God never gave up on me. Amen. I was talking to a lot of people recently that they had a, a head knowledge of salvation. They really thought they were going to heaven, and I did too. My aunt, she could testify August the 11th, 1995, that I made a profession. I didn't want to go to hell. I got in some things in my life. I know the story gets old to a lot of people. Boy, it never gets old to me. Amen. And I know you got a story. Maybe just tonight as we sing this song, just think about how the way Jesus just, he didn't have to, but he, he passed back by. Amen? amen? Somebody say amen right there. Amen. Thank God. You know, I often think about in the scripture about different people, blind Bartimaeus. When Jesus passed by him, do you understand that was the last time he ever passed by? There was others that had Jesus pass by a number of times. But nobody ever got to Jesus unless Jesus passed by. Today, even though we understand the Holy Ghost, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's still the same. Amen. Unless the Lord draws you to Himself. I remember talking to Jessica today, her and her husband, Jonathan. He said, I remember when I prayed that prayer. He said, I remember when I got down. He said, I remember saying it. He said, I just, I didn't want to go to hell. I was scared to death. He said, the other day, he said, I realized the Lord wasn't drawing me. And this is what he said. He said, we got home. He said, we didn't say a word driving all the way home Sunday. He said, I knew it was in my heart. I didn't know it was in her heart. So that night they got home. They put the bed, the kids to bed and they went and prayed. She came in there and she said, sometimes she says, well, I got something on my heart. She said, I'll just ask him, can we talk? <laughs> he said, he said, I laid in bed. He said, I sure was hoping that she was going to ask me if we could talk that night. And she asked him, she said, can we talk? And he said, yes. And she said, I need to tell you, I'm doubting my salvation. Boy, he opened up his heart and he said the same thing. He said, Brother Jason, I understood that Jesus had to pass by. I'm going to tell you something. We ought to be thankful tonight that God never gave up. No matter how low you were, no matter how far you was, no matter how bitter you and I may have been, thank God he never gave up. Amen. They're going to sing this song. You let it speak to your heart as they sing.
making Somebody's trying to find a way A heavy heart can break your will A troubled soul keeps time standing still So I know it's a very familiar portion of scripture. And um, as you open up there, I really want to get to just a few verses. Over the past several weeks, I have begun to study, uh, really not so much of study, but just me and the Lord of understanding a lot of things. I, I believe without any hesitation that if you want to love and be successful, 
as a Christian, as a leader, as a pastor, uh, if you just live like Jesus, love people like Jesus did, everything will be all right. Uh, I know that's easier said than done, but I think the Bible's very plain. I've also learned too, it's not just something that you say, but at the same time for every answer, every answer, every answer uh, that's needed for all the questions of life, it's found in the Word of God. You believe that? Say amen. And uh, there's no question. And when you get to a place to where you don't know and, and where you're doubting, where you're wondering why, uh, sometimes if you, you stay long enough, if you look long enough, if you seek long enough, uh, God will make Himself seen. I know over the past few weeks, uh, we have really expounded, talked, exposed, if you will, about salvation. Uh, I, I would dare say, and I do mean this, the only thing that can't get you to Jesus by you seeking uh, is going to be salvation. Because unless the Lord draws you, that's why the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and not, not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you understand that tonight? Say amen. Uh, I hope you do. I hope you understand. But once you're saved, you're a child of God. The Bible then says that you have access. You come boldly through the throne of grace. You, you can get to God Anywhere, anytime, any night, any storm, any valley, any mountaintop, you have access. Tonight, I want to deal with something that really settles in with me because I've tried to go back and evaluate how Jesus treated a lot of folk in the Scriptures. And in John chapter number 11, there's something that stands out. I know this is a very familiar portion of Scripture, and I know a lot of people understand it. But there was something that really stood out to me that really probably captivated me that is maybe taught me something that maybe recently over the last probably three, four, five years that I've had a hard time dealing with. and I would dare say that even on the backside, the days following, the salvations, the decisions that's been made, if I as a pastor, as a Christian, as a mentor, whatever it may be, had the opportunity to give words of wisdom to a new convert, there's a lot of things that I would say, but I know within those things, this will be one of them. That God always has a reason, not just when He answers, but you must learn that He has a reason even when He don't answer. It's probably harder to understand when He don't answer than to understand when He does. Let me make this plain to you. When I first got saved, one of my greatest burdens was my family, was my mother. I felt like God owed me something when I first got saved because immediately I started praying for my mother. And little did I know I had to learn the hard way. I came in with the Superman cape. For those of you that got recently saved, there's big obstacles or should be in your life that you don't know how God's going to fix. And immediately you feel like you get this cape that comes on your back that you can do absolutely anything. And I struggled because I remember that I had this bright idea and I was going to begin to pray for my mother and other people and even friends. I had men that was grown men that I had to witness to. I had to tell them that I was not able and allowed, if you will, by the conviction of the Holy Ghost to be able to do and partake in the things I used to do. I had some pretty big battles that was ahead of me. And then also when I came to that place of praying for my mom, I thought with a lack of tact that she was over in Arca and I'll never forget Going over there with now my wife at the time, her and I was dating. Tiffany rode with me. It was a Sunday afternoon about 2 o'clock, visiting hours. And I remember sitting there with my grandmother and then, uh, if you want to call step-grandfather, but my grandfather that was there. And I remember them talking about my mother getting changed. Now let me, let me make this relevant to all you teenagers, mom and dads, and everybody that's in here. Your struggle, your problem might not be like mine, but at the end of the day, there's always a situation at hand is when you first get saved, we automatically think that Jesus Christ owes us everything because now we have access. But that is probably one of the greatest, listen, that's one of the greatest tools that the devil uses to derail you because we put in our mind that now we've got it all figured out. It's going to be easy. Everything's going to be fine and dandy. And then it seems like by, by nothing, it just blindsides us and knocks us down. And we think, God, I'm saved. I gave you my life. I've repented of my sin. I humiliated myself. And I've been asking you and praying to you, God, you don't hear my prayer. What makes me think you're even real? And I struggle with a God that would not answer a prayer the way I wanted Him to. This text, 
you find the same thing. However, now, almost September, 13 years later, the same thing I dealt with as probably a two or three week year old Christian, week old Christian, however you say that. I'm still dealing with the same conflict. I want God to answer my questions and answer my prayers now. And I ask God a lot, many times, why? I do this in my home. I do this in my marriage. I do this in my ministry. And let me just tell you how, how I fight it. I can even see it. The Lord will even give me the platform and show me what I need to do. But yet, for whatever reason, He won't let it come to pass. And I battle with that a whole lot in my life. Because I've understood and I preach it. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I understand that. But whether you understand this or not, from the pew to the pulpit, I too have to constantly understand the patience and waiting upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably one of the most detrimental things of this church is for me to be gung-ho, arrogant, cocky, conceited, self-sufficient, to think I know what's best, sit my deacon men down, my financial men down, and act like I know what's best and tell them if they don't like it, they're out of the will of God. And I want to quote the Bible verse, touch not, not anointing, because I want to be able to shadow the fact of the things and my fear of not giving the same peace. And listen, I think for the same reason that God's not going to give them peace. And then I could be a, a spearhead. And I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying that God don't speak to a pastor. But I am telling you that I know great men that have failed and not listening to God, and they chose to do something because it's what they want to do, and God didn't want them to do, and they kicked that door down, and God made a pay for it. Maybe not just them, but their church paid for it as well. Right. Amen, preacher. That's good preaching, especially an independent fundamental Baptist movement. Because we are the supremest when it comes to don't touch me. I'm, just, I'm being honest with you. Right. We are. And I'm going to tell you this, I do believe that, but I believe if a man has to command and demand the authority that God's given him, he's out of the will of God. I don't think a man should have to do it. That's the Holy Ghost job. You, can't, you cannot force somebody to do that. that. You can't make a heart that's wicked be pure. Everybody all right? You understand what I'm trying to say to you? I'm not saying men's out of the will of God. I'm just saying it's a battle to be patient with God. There's some of you in here right now, and I'm, tonight's message is very different. It's not deep, it's not long. There's some of you in here right now battling with cancer, struggles, financial issues, issues that's recently happened in the past that you're still trying to put the puzzle pieces together. And you don't know how to do it, and it's getting long. It's not your problem as much as it is the duration of the problem that's weighing on you. You find yourself that you're praying, and you're praying endlessly, and you're praying and you're almost, you're, you're helpless. You're, you're trying. You're desperate. And it might not even be for your burden. It might be for a burden of somebody else. And it's not even selfish. You're praying for somebody else because you love them and you care for them. You know, let, let's go back to the kids that just got saved. It might be for a loved one that gets saved. And you can say what you want if you're better than me. But I'm going to be honest with you sometimes. Just as that song, I can trust Jesus. You know, I have prayed some prayers and felt as if they were never heard. Man, I've been in that boat many a time. Many a time. Teenagers, you hear me when I say this to you. You have to seek God because you're going to get knocked down. But that's the way that God teaches you. For those of you who got saved, Rachel, as much as we love you and appreciate you and applaud you with all these girls that accept the Lord, and you've got a backbone, you've got thick skin because you came through some stuff. Let me, think, let me say this to you. If you and every other adopted child think that you've been through something hard, I'm saying this from experience, and that pretty lady over there, my aunt who raised me, if you think that I'm telling you a lie, you can ask her, your troubles in life, if you want to be used of God, have just begun. Because now God's got to get all those scars, all those bitterness, all those emotions that you have hoarded from all the questions that's been in life to where now He's got to bring it out. He's got to mold you to understand that God's way is not your way to where then you can be turned into a vessel to be used of God to be able to minister to another teenager, another young lady one day. The troubles must come to mold you. And it's not ever easy. I want you to look at just two verses because I know you know the text, but you have to be able to see this. The verse, Bible says in verse number 5 of chapter number 11 of the book of John, 
Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, being Mary, and he also loved Lazarus, of course. You see the text. The Bible says this in verse number 6, When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. You may look this way. We're talking about now a man that had an impact. Mark chapter number 2, the Bible says that when it was noise that he was in the place, that it was so much you couldn't even get people into the place where Jesus was. He, I mean, this, this man had fed 5,000. I mean, he, he had made the lame to walk and the blind to see. I mean, this was the man that all he had to do, and listen to me, he didn't have to show up. He could speak the Word and it could happen. The Bible says for whatever reason in verse number 6, that when he heard that he was sick, Newsflash, when you get on your knees in your face on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, or at your altar in your house, or whether you're riding down the road, or when you begin to pray to God, when you begin to find yourself doing that week after week, that moment when you lay your burden, your prayer request, your need, after you thank the Lord for what He's done for you, you begin to tell God, now this is my burden. You said, cast all your burdens upon Him. Lord, I'm doing that. I'm laying it down in your hands. All of a sudden, you want to let it go. You want to walk away. And you want to know it's all right. Now the problem is, is when you tell God that, and it seems like God's just leaning up by the door, act like nothing's happened. Your heart's broken. Your children are suffering. They've got medical situations. They've been in and out of the hospital. You're hearing the word cancer. There's been fires and there's been deaths and there's been sorrow and there's frustrations in the home. And you finally have humbled yourself to go to God. And you say, God, I'm here. I'm telling you, I got a need right now. And God just sits back. The Bible says he abode. That means he tarried. He waited. If I could give you a an illustration, it'd be like me saying, hey y'all, the church is on fire. And me calling the fire department and then finish watching Dukes of Hazard and, <laughs> amen, and, and, and Andy Griffith and finish eating that steak dinner before they came and helped us. Let's just be honest, we'd be upset, wouldn't we? We'd be mad. And we would wonder, listen, we would be more hurt by wanting to know why they did what they did than the fact of what happened happened the way it did. There's some people that you see in this text, and I'm going to lay them out to you, one being Mary. and Mary was a lady that came, and the Bible says that she had laid at His feet. I mean, she was a lady that anointed Him. She loved Him, and she worshipped Him. There's some things that I want you to be able to nail down even though that you're worshiping. I want to go ahead and say this for the record. I'm a crier. I'm a worshiper. I like to raise my hands. I'll shout and say amen. You ain't got to prime me up to be thankful and be able to think about what God's done for me. That is me. Now, yes, I'm a worker. I want to be like Martha too. And uh, I can go back and forth. But at the end of the day, some of us are made up to where you are a worker or you are a worshiper. You might be the person that comes in here and you don't say nothing. You're not going to lift up a hand. You're not ever going to cry. You're not going to weep. You're not going to come to the altar. You're never going to get in the choir. You're never going to sing a song. And you're never going to even say, a whoop. you know, you're not going to say, amen or praise the Lord. That's not going to be you. You're not a worshiper. But what you will do is you'll shake hands. You'll pick up cigarette butts and you'll 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 do things around the church that nobody sees you'll take out the trash and, and, and you'll walk up and down to make sure the doors are locked and, and you'll teach and you'll do all these things you some of us are made up a little bit different but but those of us that are a worshiper there's some things that i want you to understand in this text that a lot of times that we fail to forget and this is it number one you worship the lord jesus christ because you know he's faithful can i get an amen we worship the Lord because we know that He is worthy of everything. But when you come to a crisis in your life like this, and God is not answering your prayer, you need to mark it down in the back of your mind and sell it down in your soul that the very one that you have worshipped, the very one that you have done everything for, the very one that you lift up holy hands and, and you worship His feet and you lift up His name and you do all of that, every day you worship, it will always prepare you for the battle that you have ahead. Because there's been times that I have found myself riding down the road and I worship God in church. And it's that same song, Brother Shane, that I'm worshiping in church that comes on my radio six weeks down the road whenever I'm sitting there now facing my crisis. 
don't let the devil lie to you because God is the lane that He's changed. The same God that you worshipped six weeks ago is the same God that you're still worshipping today. The other thing is you find yourself to where you look at this from that standpoint that the Bible says in verse number 3 that they sent for Jesus. Now remember this. You're not worshiping the church and you're not worshiping the preacher. You're not worshiping the, the, the building. You're not worshiping all that stuff. When you worship, I need to let you know that you've got to settle down in your heart that when things happen, you still need to go to the one that you are worshiping about. You don't sin for the preacher. You don't sin for your mama. You don't sin for your best friend or the greatest saint of your life. Never get to the place that you put Jesus second place. Always keep Christ first in every situation of your life. Don't have time to go down that road. But I'll tell you, if you don't, it's because you're battling spiritual warfare. Always find yourself testifying about how good God is because there's going to come a day that all you can do is run on what He's done and not what He's doing. Y'all with me? Say amen. I want to say this. The Bible says that then all of a sudden Lazarus dies, of course. He's waiting. Here she is. I mean, can you imagine? She's, Lord, come to Him. He's dying. You know, I, it comes to this place to where she's expecting the Lord to do something. She's expecting Jesus to rise, raise Lazarus up. But the problem is, is this, is she don't necessarily get there in time. So now her hopes get worse. And it seems like things are very difficult. And if you're anything like me, I always hear people testify about what to do and that God answers prayer. But what I want to know is who's going to write me a book about what to do when God doesn't answer my prayer. Can I tell you something? I don't get a lot of questions about what to do when God shows up. Probably seven out of ten questions I get, Brother Jason, what do I do because I don't feel like God's answering me? Seven out of ten questions. And literally, we find ourselves being confused and distraught and wonder what in the world do I do? The Bible says that Lazarus dies, that he's done, that he's dead, that he's gone. The problem is, is that here they are, and Mary's got to go, they got to figure it all out, and they don't know what to do. I wrote this down. The funniest thing in my, my, my ministry is that people always get upset when the pastor don't show up or send somebody that looks just like the pastor. Can I get amen? <laughs> Can I get amen, Brother Larry? Amen. Can I get another amen, brother there? Amen. Amen. If you could run, you'd run on that point right there, wouldn't you? Amen. They just feel like he's got to be there. But I wonder how many of you tonight, without lifting your hands up, know what it feels like to when you call for the Lord and the Lord just don't show up. And you're in your midnight hour. You're confused. It might not, listen, it might not be dying. It might not be cancer. But you just, you, and it might be a simple prayer. But it matters to you. It's a hard journey. See, the last time this happened, everybody with me say amen. Let's study your Bible here, but let's listen to me. I'm trying to teach you tonight. I, I know I've not been bouncing off the walls the past three weeks, but. I'm enjoying teaching, so you forgive me. The last time this happened, Jarius had came to him because he said, my, my daughter's dying. Can you imagine being him? His daughter's dying, and all of a sudden, Jesus takes a time out because a woman with an issue of blood pressed through the crowd. Y'all remember the story? And he turned around, and he healed that woman because she touched the hem of his garment. Y'all remember that? Say Amen. It's fair to say by argument that Jesus can say, I got an excuse why I was late, Jarius. I stopped and helped somebody else. Well, let's go back to reality of John chapter number 11. There is no excuse. Jesus just chose not to answer. See, it's one thing for me to be able to say, okay, I'm in a conflict, and I know Mavis and Neil's got something back going on. Okay, Lord, I understand. I could put myself to the side because you're dealing with them. And Lord, I know that it's Miss Debbie's birthday. Happy birthday. 
Amen. And it's her birthday today, and she struggled with a lot of things. So, Lord, I'm going to put myself to the side. I understand it. But when you see things are kind of just what they need to be, and God, you still don't answer me, am I out of your will? Are you mad at me, God? Because there's no excuse for you not to show up right now in my life. Can you, get the, can you just get the view of what I'm trying to say tonight? So this is what he does. He answers, and notice the text if you will so I can give it to you. The Bible says in verse number 6 that he heard therefore and he abode. And pretty much what he wants them to know is that he had to wait. And he did not want to do what they thought that he should do because if he'd done what they thought he should do, then they would think that they could control him. And he loved them enough. Listen to my mamas. You'll, you'll perk up when I say this. Jesus loved them enough to have tough love. I want to take you over just a few verses. And I want you to notice what the Bible says, if you will. In verse number 42, the same chapter, the Bible says this, And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. God loves you and me so much that even when His, listen to me, when His love is criticized, He'll tell you no because somebody needs to see God through your story. Amen. Tiffany talked a lot about these beautiful ashes, beautiful ashes and different things. And I, I'd already known about a lot of this that I was studying. And you ever watch some people and you wonder how in the world can they go through so much? You realize that God just got tough love with them so much simply because He loves them. And He loves them so much that that other prayer you've been praying for for that loved one, He's answering that other prayer by not answering the prayer you're asking Him now. Amen. It's been many things in my life over the past few years I've asked God to do. I have to say that for a long time I asked God to be able to give me a church that I thought was spiritually grounded with the Word of God. I really feel like as a core, not as a whole. <laughs> Amen. But as a core, our church is getting spiritually grounded. I wouldn't dare do it, but if you knew the hell, if you knew the chapter, of how we got to where we are. God denied answering my prayers because He was answering this prayer. Some of you have seen, criticized, <laughs> critiqued, will take a little less of a, my wife for a long time because you've known her. But let's just be real. She's different now than she used to be. God didn't answer some of her prayers because ultimately God was answering other prayers. And God did it because He knew what was in the big picture of things. Because there was going to be people. I was watching. She told me today that one of the young ladies, Jasmine Tiff, is that her name? I wrote her, done something. She said today in her testimony that it wasn't one, two girls. It was three girls that she led to the Lord. I'm not saying this to be critical to her. You know why God gave her that platform? Because God's molded her. And now God's blessing her. And now God's using her. She's not Jason Holly's wife. She's not Ron Gross and Daphne Gross's daughter. She's not Nolan's mom. She sometimes acts like that little bratty girl I know, but that's not her no more. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, go say amen, Brother Larry. Goodness. We need marriage counseling. Listen to me. Let's just be honest. Sometimes the hardest people to reach is the people that you're close to. Can you imagine the pressure of being raised in this church and then trying to be the pastor's wife? You know her flaws, you know her weaknesses, you know her fears, her insecurities. You know her temper? You know her temper. 
You know her temper. Must I remind you of that oven with the fork again? Pow! But you know why God delayed? And I could tell you by these two eyes and by these two ears that many times that I've heard her in addition to me in my own little world begging God for certain things. And it seemed like God just kept saying no. No. It's because God would see later on down the road on June, July the 3rd, 2016 of what He was trying to mold for this moment and this time. I want to show you a few other things here. I, I'm done. Miss Deborah, you go ahead and come. I'm done. I'm just, I'm talking about the God that loves us so much not to answer the prayers that we're asking. The lame. The Bible says in the same text, notice this, that Martha comes. I love this. Some of y'all are this way. Verse number 22, listen to this. But I know that even now, whatsoever that will ask of God, God will give it to you. Listen, some of us, our faith might get weak, but we know that even now, Jesus can still do what Jesus wants to do. But you know why God's not testing you in that area? You ever notice how sometimes the same trial can affect people completely different? I'll say that again. You know how the same trial, maybe mom and dad, maybe listen to this. You ever notice how that child will affect you different than it does daddy or that child will affect you different than it does mama? Because God can take the same situation that can affect two different people two different ways. Because we're once, listen to me, where one's faith is weak, the other one's strong. Amen. She said, even now. That's what Martha said. The Bible says that he comes down, and I want you to listen to this, and I'm done. Verse number 34, Jesus spoke, and he says, where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? Look up, look up here. I'll tie it together. He said, I want you to take me back to where you lost faith in me. He didn't sell, tell me. He said, I want you to take me. You know what we need to do? We need to allow the Lord to get in the middle of our problems. The reason we lost faith is because we never took Him there. We're just telling Him. We never let Him in the middle of our mess. Come on now. Y'all wake up and smell the coffee. The Lord wants to be in the middle. And He says, show me. Take me. You know why? Sometimes you have to go back to that dark room that nobody sees in your heart. And God says, I want you to take me right there so I can increase your faith. And then He said, roll away that stone. Well, that stone was down. Because let's just be honest. As you're sitting there watching that stone roll away, you're thinking, ha, ain't no way this ain't going to happen. But God said, roll away that doubt. And what you realize in the midst of everything, and He says in the Scripture, notice the text, I read it a while ago, that others may believe. I know you believe. Mark, I know you believe, but your children don't believe. You know why I let you go through this? Because I was talking through your children. You might have understood, but they did. Jeff, you might have understood, but your family different. Michelle, you might have understood, but your mom and daddy didn't. They didn't know. And this trial where you thought I never heard you, where you thought I never listened to you, where you thought I never responded to you, oh, I was responding because I was answering the other prayer request you had because those you love that's around you, I'm increasing their faith because you took me to the place where you lost faith in me. I want to tell you this in closing. Some of you men are my heroes and you women. And I'm there going to say to you that it's not fair the faith that you got to have. And it's a heavy load to be the stronghold in your family. And if you're anything like me, you get frustrated when everybody else is losing control 
and you lose control too, usually I'm okay when everybody else is crazy as long as I'm okay. But if it gets me where I start getting fear, it starts getting hard. And I want to tell you something I've learned, and this is Bible. That if God can take Alyssa, where you at? Miss Angie, Noah, when God can get this man humble to his knees, when you know when the winds blow that he's still strong, and when life happens that he's still there, and when all's crazy, my father still stands, there's something you can learn from that, but there's something greater, listen to me, church, that you'll learn. When he has to get to his knees and he don't have control, God will teach you how to lean upon the Lord when you don't have nothing else. You can't teach that by just teaching. It comes by experience. Aunt Bill, you love me? Okay, good. July 1995. She had an oldest son that passed away. Michael was his name. Us boys have ran the world and ran the roads for a long time. I've seen my aunt be torn upside down because never knowing why I take him. Why I take him. It was a struggle. But do you remember 1995 was the same year I made a profession of faith? Go with me. From 1995 to 2003, I watched my Aunt Billy lean upon the Lord and she was my stronghold. I'm sure God never did answer a prayer during the time because I don't know if you can ever get a sufficient answer why God would take a child. Does anybody think it's fair to bury your own children? There's nobody. But I'm not God, but I know this, that when God wasn't answering that prayer, He was answering this prayer. Because I watched her weather the storm. I watched her never give up on God. I watched her never quit. And when she was asking God why, God was speaking to my heart the whole time. Today, I'm a product of being an answer prayer from an unanswered prayer. God took him to show those around God's still real and Jesus still saved. Michael's not a pastor today. Some of you don't even know who he is, if any. But the life that's been touched through her, through him, is now reaching you. So his life still speaks because of being an unanswered prayer. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Don't get bitter for what God don't answer. Embrace what the Lord does and let God speak. Father, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for not just what you do and how you answer, but thank you for what you don't do. Thank you for what you don't answer and the way that we ask. And God, I pray that you use this just to help somebody that's still wondering why. In Jesus' name. As a pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. But the great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. 
Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. As the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? I want to ask you, would you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.